Hello everyone and welcome back to the Sukuri webinars series. My name is Val and I'll be your moderator for today's as well. Uh, the topic we chose for today's webinar is CWF for mid-market enterprise organizations. But before I hand it over to Dana, our presenter, just a few housekeeping rules. As usual, we'd love to hear from you during today's presentation. So if you have any question for our presenter, please feel free to send it through the Q&A tab in your Zoom window, or you can also tweet us at Sukuri Security, and make sure you use the hashtag AskSukuri so we can easily find your question. Dana will be answering questions at the end of the session, but if we don't get to your question during today's webinar, we will be sure to follow up with all of you via email. Again, all questions and answers from today will be made available on our website within a few days. And today's webinar will also be available as a video recording with all slides being sent to registrants. We'd like to encourage you to share today's webinar, of course, with your friends and followers on your social profiles. And with that, I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, Dana Dickerson. Dana, welcome and please take it away. Well, thank you very much, Val. I appreciate the uh, introduction and, and welcome everyone who was able to attend today and uh, those who might be watching this uh, recording down the road. Uh, like Val mentioned, my name is Dana Dickison. Um, I, I work here at Sakuri currently as a, an enterprise account executive and, and been a big part of heading up the push into the mid-market and enterprise for Sakuri over the last few years. Uh, I've always been really passionate about protecting people and things and, and security in general. Uh, I'm a former police officer for about 10 years here in uh, Canada where I reside and uh, I've been with Sukuri for the past three years now and really pumped up and passionate about what we're doing here at Sukuri and, and, and the way we're trying to make the internet a, a better place. Um, <clears throat> In my free time, I, I, I'm involved heavily in martial arts. So I'm a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt style of, of grappling martial arts. Uh, been involved in that for a long time. Re really enjoy that a lot. And also an avid guitar player. And I know if, if you're, I'm broadcasting here from my home uh, office in Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada, and I'm sure you can see some guitars in the background. So uh, that's been my newest obsession over the last few years. Um, so in this webinar, uh, you know, full disclosure, it, it, this is going to be pretty high level, not a technical deep dive into what um, a, a cloud-based web application firewall is. But what I want to try and do is give you an overview uh, today, just talk a bit about why security is important and, and the implications of uh, security and, and security breaches, why there's an advantage to choosing a cloud-based web application firewall, and then what or you know, how do we define what an enterprise grade solution uh, really is? So to get things started, what, why is security important? So in this slide, it really just talks about the two different types of impacts that uh, a cybersecurity breach can have on an organization. First is the business side of things. So the impact to the brand, the damage to the reputation. Uh, there's the economic impact and, you know, that's lost business, whether that's current business or future business. There's the cost of remediation, the cost of engaging forensics fines that might be associated due to compliance issues. There's also the emotional distress. And I, I really feel like in my experience, I've, I've dealt with a lot of clients, uh, both enterprise clients and, and small businesses who have uh, an, an infected website or web server and they're dealing with these issues. And I really do think that they look like that little icon while, while I'm speaking with them for the first time. Um, the good thing is, is there's, there's people like us out, out there that can help you get back on track, but it is very taxing to an organization and the team working around the clock, trying to fix these issues. Uh, some technical impacts, things like the blacklisting of a domain, uh, which can take, you know, time and at the mercy of, of say Google to delist. Uh, the impacts to SEO, and I, I'm sure that a lot of marketing teams who work so hard on, on SEO uh, really feel that, that damage that's done through a compromise. And really, I think, you know, the hot topic nowadays, and rightfully so, is, is the protection of, of visitor or customer data. Um, you know, we're seeing things like GDPR that are focused on data protection. Uh, we're seeing other countries and regions starting to follow suit. So protecting your customers' data is, is so critical right now. Um, some interesting statistics and, and some, some facts. Uh, it's estimated that cybercrime damage 
costs will hit six trillion dollars annually by 2021. Um, so, you know, we're seeing uh, an increase year after year in the costs of the damages to organizations around the world. However, cybersecurity spending is going to exceed a trillion dollars between 2017 and 2021. So we're seeing that even though the spending is going up year after year, so are the damages. So something's not quite right. Our, uh, it makes me wonder if we're spending our dollars in the right place. Um, so those are, you know, some pretty staggering numbers when we think about it. <clears throat> to, to break this down a little bit further, um, you know, we all hear about the big breaches, but the average cost per stolen record, according to the, the Ponymon study in 2017, uh, sponsored by IBM, is $225 per record. That's closer to 300 325 if those are, for instance, medical records. And the average number of records stolen is 28,500. So, you know, that's a, a substantial amount of records. And when you start multiplying those two numbers, uh, you know, you can see the impacts it has on, on any size organization. There are those fringe cases that we hear about all the time, like Equifax, who, you know, in 2017 lost 143 or 145 million records. It included in that were 140 some million social security numbers, 100 million addresses, even th close to 300,000 credit card numbers exposed. So, you know, those are really serious numbers with, with, with big implications. Even using the numbers that we first looked at, the 225 per, per record and, and the 28,000 records, and that works out in the range of $6 million for uh, the cost of a data breach for for an enterprise or or a mid market company or really any size company that that loses that amount of of records so we can't we can't ignore security unfortunately the costs are real and the risks are real so why is web security so important well you know i i know from my experience in visiting rsa this year really stood out to me that the the focus is still on the network but web applications are really low hanging fruit. You know, they're open doors to the internet and often uh, lead very deep into an organization's network. So it's important to address uh, web security specifically. Um, when we're talking about web security, and I know today is about the CWAF, which is just an element to this, but I, I really love this idea of creating a security framework, um, which I think is a really, uh, fluid way to have this kind of continuum to help you understand the important aspects that you need to address. So when we look at this, it sort of starts with the identification and that can be identifying the web apps, assets, the applications, the domains, the hosting environments. I've spoken to many large organizations who just have no idea where their websites are, how many web properties they have, how many domains they have, how they're hosted, who are those asset owners within the organization. So being able to inventory those assets and really have a grasp on where those things live, that's very valuable to an organization. The larger the organization, the more web properties, the, the, the bigger issue this becomes. Um, identification can also be about, you know, things like pen testing, looking to identify vulnerabilities on a regular basis and, and investigating your weaknesses so that you can address those. When we're talking about protection, um, certainly patching, hardening, th those are helpful but can be hard to manage. Um, especially a lot of organizations are using third-party developers and uh, that, that becomes even more challenging to get those patches and updates rolled out in, in a timely fashion. This protection aspect is where a tool such as a cloud-based web application firewall fits. Um, that's what we're gonna focus on today, but just, just continuing on to sort of sum up the rest of this diagram. When we're talking about detection, we're looking at um, monitoring for malware, for instance, uh, monitoring file changes, having visibility into blacklisting of domains and, and other indicators of compromise. So if there is something wrong, there's something up, there's malware on the network, files are being changed that shouldn't be, things are being inserted that shouldn't be, do you have a way to detect those issues and those items? And then the, the last piece, uh, you know, response and recover, that's really the aftermath of of an infection. The response could be the cleaning, the blacklist removal, uh, the customer management, 
Um, the recovery could be things like the forensics, the rebuilding of, of trust. And it's not ideal to get that far. Uh, that's, that's a long way down the rabbit hole. And really, an ounce of protection is worth a pound of cure. So we, we, we want that protection in place so we can mitigate these types of incidents. So how can we manage the risk uh, of, of security risk for web applications? Um, you know, a few sort of high level ways to do that are through access control, uh, just like you would in the network, you know, uh, using sensible user access, uh, applying the rule of least privilege. So uh, people only need to be able to do what they absolutely need to be able to do for their role. Um, the hosting and, 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 uh, uh, host servers, you know, make sure the iOS is, or the OS rather is updated, you know, separating the, the databases from the applications, uh, setting up DMZs and, and capsulizing sites so that we can avoid cross-contamination if, if there are an issue. Um, so those are some, you know, some hosting uh, considerations, but, but our specialty is about web, website attacks. And, and this is where you can use a CWAF to mitigate attacks on the web application itself, things like brute force, the DDoS attacks, and the exploitation of software vulnerabilities. To define a, a cloud-based WAF. So a cloud-based WAF is a web application firewall. The WAF stands for web application firewall that's housed or, or, or lives in a cloud network. So for Securi, for instance, our cloud app or our web application firewall, it uh, sits in the cloud on our network of data centers. And the application is pointed to the uh, firewall through an A record. So instead of the traffic going directly from the browser to the host server, uh, first it has to pass through the web application firewall on our network. Um, so that, that's in a high level, the idea is that we can block malicious requests and allow the good requests to uh, through to the host server. The firewall consists of really two elements or two, two platforms that are running there. The first is the intrusion detection system or the IDS. And the IDS actually inspects the packets it analyzes the behavior of the request. Now that an analysis is based on the log data that's captured by the WAF. The IDS is looking at behaviors. So it's analyzing behaviors such as repetition, the number of requests in a period of time and response types like 404s or 403s. So it's a behavior-based tool. Um, the web application firewall, that uses signatures and heuristics. So it actually analyzes the request itself and it blocks known malicious requests, but it also blocks requests that look like known malicious, malicious requests. And that's part of the learning of, of the system. Um, Securi is really a leading researcher in, in web application vulnerabilities and, and we're constantly updating our rules to address those zero day threats or, or those emerging threats. So the obvious benefit of a cloud-based WAF or a firewall is that we can mitigate the attacks before they reach your network. And, you know, things like mitigation of all types of DDoS attacks or denial of service attacks, uh, prevention of vulnerability exploits like SQL injection or cross-site scripting or request forgeries, uh, protection against the OWASP top 10 um, and more for, for Securi, really all, Security blocks all known uh, threats and, and nearly all unknown attacks. Um, the, another benefit that, that some people don't realize is that Sakuri is actually built on a CDN. So we're built on an AnyCast network of globally distributed data centers and, and each of those data centers is a caching server as well. So we can send the static you know, uh, content from our servers as opposed to calling back to the host. So this is great when it comes to optimizing the server and reducing the server load. Uh, the caching can, can be customized to various levels. Um, caching is also great to help mitigate DDoS. So for instance, if there's a distributed attack hitting a single page, then we can keep serving the cache to them and, and they're, they're never getting back to the host server. Although, you know, the IDS would block that behavior, but that's just an example of the benefit of caching. Most of our customers see an improvement in, in speed, and, and in some cases, it, it can be quite dramatic. And a neat feature of the Security dashboard is that it actually uh, analyzes the performance increase and shows you that in a visual. So uh, great when it comes to the reporting aspect of things. 
Um, so, so that's just a really quick overview of, of how the firewall works and some of the benefits, but what separates uh, an enterprise grade service from uh, a direct to consumer service? And really, you know, we've identified what, what we feel is important and what our customers have told us is important to them. And we've included those things in our service so, so that we can serve that need. And first and foremost, and I think one of the most important services that we offer as part of our, our enterprise platforms, and, and I can see it as a downfall not doing this, is the onboarding. So the risk of an issue is, is the highest during setup. So we need to be able to deliver a service where we can work closely with our customers to come up with a deployment plan. So things like testing, go live planning, and then being able to offer real real time, real live support during those initial days to ensure that the, everything is working perfectly, um, especially when the, when the application is live behind the firewall. Um, custom rule creation is, is another item. Really, it goes hand in hand with the onboarding, the ability to create custom rules to make sure, and, and this is a simplification of things, but, but really the custom rules, we wanna make sure that requests that should be blocked are blocked and most importantly, that requests that shouldn't be blocked are not blocked. Um, so, you know, complex applications, they need complex solutions and, and offering that as part of our service has, has been uh, really helpful to our clients. Um, you need a software that accounts for enterprise grade infrastructure. So things like uh, multiple hosting IPs, uh, DMZ, failover IPs, using a load balancer, using uh, your own CDN or, or your favorite CDN, um, the solution needs to be able to fit your environment. Whether that needs to be customized or, or whether that's a, an inherent feature, it's important that those things are addressed. Um, as far as UI capabilities go, you know, having multi-tenancy in the dashboard is super important and being able to designate roles so that you can limit permissions and sort of use that that rule of least privilege in the Sakuri UI as well. Another thing we're asked for a lot and, and that Sakuri provides really well are API functions. So essentially anything that can be done in the Sakuri dashboard can be done through an API. So in theory you can build out all the management of the of the firewall um, without ever entering the dashboard. Things like adding, removing domains, adjusting caching, whitelisting, blacklisting, et cetera. So all of those things can be done through the UI. Another important aspect is, you know, taking, I, I, I think it's about the meaning of the solution. And there's, there's, it means something different to each person, but you need to be able to get the information that's meaningful to you in an easy way. And that's something that, that we strive to do. So, in the dashboard itself or available through the API uh, are, are some great reports. And we really break things down into three types of reports. The first is real-time reports, which are really a snapshot of what is going on now, both allowed and blocked requests. The second are historic uh, audit logs. So what Sakuri does is from the moment a site is live on our network, we uh, store the audit logs for our clients. Um, and so those historic logs of the block requests are there for your analysis. It's also part of our service, especially in the enterprise space to help understand those logs or, or parse logs or go through logs to, to help you guys find the information that you need. Um, the, the last piece is what I like to call, and that's why I use the quotes. It's not what Sakuri calls them, it's what I call them, but they're management style reports. So this is the, what are we spending our money on question uh, that we all need to answer. So these are great graphs that break down how many requests are being blocked to how many are allowed, what type of attacks are being blocked, where are they coming from, really the meat and potato type of information. And these reports can be generated automatically and sent out daily, weekly, monthly, um, and they're, they're great for the higher ups. Um, a lot of the enterprise uh, organizations that we work with, they use a SIM solution, something like QRadar or Splunk or LogRhythm, you know, an event management system. So it's important that we are able to integrate with those systems and, and provide our logs. Um, so we can do that in, in a various different ways. Um, most simply is, you know, through a syslog, um, but you know, a lot of times we need encrypted options to send those logs. So things like setting up a VPN, 
uh, or using the API, our API or the API of the uh, SIM solution can help. And, you know, in the SIM solution, then you can set parameters that will alert your security operations. If you're seeing a certain number of attacks or attacks or certain on certain domains or, uh, you know, you can also create internal reports. So, so really useful information. Uh, I think the, the biggest factor um, between success and failure in, in, in the enterprise space is how you provide support. And we, we've learned that uh, through our experience that the demands of a large organization, um, you know, the, it, it's, it, the support has to be there. So, so we need to be able to provide dedicated support channels um, with a response SLA that really fits to the business needs. It, if you need to have a response in 30 minutes to a support issue, then that's what we need to be able to provide. So we have the ability to customize those support SLAs based on the needs of the business and of our clients. Um, you know, also creating clear escalation paths to address issues. So for one, we have dedicated support channels for our enterprise team, which I think is so important that you go to an analyst who has the skills and ability to deal with complex problems. Um, however, it, there's always a need for escalation. There, there are always circumstances that will need escalation. So having those clearly defined paths is part of the scope of work for us. So teaching you, how, you know, and, 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 and sort of providing to you the, those paths is very valuable. Also providing dedicated account management, someone that you know you can call when, when you need help. And, and supporting the, the enterprise is, is a challenge, but it's also very rewarding. You know? So uh, I, I'll finish off with a quote uh, from Jeff Bezos, and, and I really love this quote. I, I have this written up on my blackboard. We see our customers as invited guests to a party, and we are the hosts. It's our job every day it's our job every day to make every important aspect of the customer experience a little bit better. And that's really what we're, we're trying to do here on in our enterprise team. And uh, I guess with that, I'm, I'm going to turn it over to some questions that was short and sweet, but uh, I'm open to any questions that you might have. Thanks Dana. Um, yes, actually one of the first questions that came in was exactly that talking about the uh, seam and SOC integration which I saw you already covered in your uh, last slide. So, unless... Yes, absolutely. We're, we're really fortunate here that one of our teammates uh, has experience. He, he managed one of the largest uh, Splunk uh, deployments in the world. So he has a lot of experience and we've set up custom integrations for many different uh, SIM platforms. So it's something that we, you know, we, treat on a case by case basis, but for, for most uh, of the major providers, we, we have a, a set way of doing it. Awesome. Uh, Stacy asks a question. It's a bit longer, so I'll try to uh, paraphrase as much as possible. Sure. And she has a bit, a bit of um, something that is not clear to her. So she's asking, can you help clarify my understanding? As I understand the CWAF, such as provided by security is preferred as in can catch problems before they hit the website, as opposed to the web application firewall that some WordPress security plugins offer, for example. So could you speak a bit to that? Right. Yeah, yeah, 100%. So the concept of a web application firewall is, you know, a tool that's built on a set of rules and uh, will, will block malicious requests. Now, the difference between a cloud-based WAF and a, uh, say, a plugin-based WAF is that the cloud-based WAF is on a separate network. So it doesn't require the resources of the web application or of the host server to be able to mitigate those attacks. So that's one huge advantage is that now those attacks are mitigated on our network before they ever reach the, the host, which is one advantage. Um, you know, the other being that it, 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 it doesn't tie up, uh, or, or sorry, rather, we're able to update those rules in near real time by how, you know, we're not relying on our customers to update the plugin. We're updating the rules in, on our network and applying those automatically. So it's really seamless uh, as from a management perspective for the client. Awesome. Going on, um, 
I had a question here from Thomas. Is such a solution applicable as a replacement for part or the entire security teams in, in our organizations? Sorry, can you read that again, Val? Is such a solution applicable as a replacement for part or the entire security team in our organization? Well, I don't think so. No, I mean, there's many facets to security, of course. You know, there's network security, there's there's host security, there's, you know, there there's the, the understanding uh, and building of, of solutions that protect all aspects. What, what we're really addressing specifically is the web application. Um, so, you know, a, a good security uh, approach is a combination of people, processes, and technology. So we still need the, those, those smart people that can do their jobs. We also need educated people that understand security risks across the organization, not just security folks. Um, you know, we need the, those proper processes in place, which are created by security folks. And then you need good tools in place that can mitigate these types of threats. But it's always going to take security people to have a look at the results of these of these uh, tools, like our logs, for instance, and and make meaningful assumptions from that. So, no, I don't think it necessarily replaces people, uh, but I think it complements a, a a security approach. Good. A um, couple of more questions here. How long does it take to implement such a WAF solution? Well, that that's an interesting question, and I guess. Um, you know, there's really a couple of scenarios that, that we'll deal with on a regular basis. And, and you know, w when we have uh, very little urgency from an organization, it's a preventative measure, um, then, you know, we can certainly accelerate timelines, but it's preferable to take the appropriate amount of time to test, to run what we call a POC or a proof of concept so that we can ensure that when we go live, things are going to work well. Then we like to create a plan, you know, really treat the onboarding like a project, uh, set out goals and, and timelines and depending on the complexity and the number of domains we're onboarding and then execute that plan and then provide that support as we go live. So the question of how long does it take in that scenario really depends on a lot of factors. But for an example, uh, we have several clients that come to us when they're already had a breach and we've had cases where there's been a publicly disclosed breach um, and there's a huge amount of urgency. And in those cases, we can, you know, we, we've deployed in as little as 24 hours. Um, so, you know, just depending on the urgency and the needs of the client, really, it, 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 it depends how we'll approach that. If there's not a rush, then it's great to take the time and work out all the little kinks. But if we need to work fast because of urgency, then we can do that. Okay, and of course, there's always going to be this question, so I'm going to let you treat it the way you want. How much does such a solution cost? Yeah, it's that's an interesting question. Um, you know, we have we have a pretty straightforward cost model in a sense where uh, we provide unlimited bandwidth to our clients. We we don't charge overage fees or a line items for things like SSL or or other add-ons that that we might see in the across the industry. But we really do price our enterprise um, engagements on an ad hoc basis because there's a lot to consider, you know, the, the size and complexity of the web application, the number of domains, the amount of traffic, the risk, um, you know, uh, the, the SLA requirements. So it's, it's kind of a, the typical IT answer is it, it depends, but it does. It depends on, on a lot of factors. Um, but what I can say is, you know, Sakuri is, is really competitive um, with, with, with the rest of, of the industry, but I think really offers a, a head above in service. Yeah, well, Wasn't really an answer, Val, but I'm, I apologize. Well, I'm sure people can still reach you uh, over email. Like you uh, of course. Email. If, if anybody has any specific questions, I'm always happy to hear from people. Uh, Dana at Sakuri.net is my email. Um, you if anybody is emailing you today, they can also say happy birthday. You haven't shared that, Dana, so I'm going to share uh, that, ah. folks. It's Dana's birthday today. I'm not going to say how old you are, but uh, you obviously look much younger. <laughs> yes, thank you. I won't disclose how old I am, but I'm somewhere between uh, 40 and 42. I'm right in the middle. <laughs> but, uh, you know, these, these uh, Canadian summers keep me young. <laughs> we're almost we're almost on time here uh, I wanted to really thank you for being with us even if it's your birthday so we do appreciate that 
thank you uh, to everyone who participated. Thank you for the questions. Uh, as we mentioned in the beginning, for those who haven't attended right in the beginning, we will have a recording uh, released and we're gonna have a Dana slide also on our, on our site. I'm gonna email all the registrants. And again, thank you so much for being with us today. And thank you, Dana. Thank you, Val. Just one last thing, if, you know, if, if anyone listening wants to take a deep dive, understand more about the technology, have a look at our dashboard. Uh, we're always happy to, to walk you through the dashboard and provide a little bit of a demo. And, and you know, there's, that, that doesn't make any obligation. If you're just curious, that's, that's good enough for me. P please, by all means, reach out. You can find me on Twitter or, or uh, through email. Awesome. Thank awesome. you. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you, Val. Cheers, everybody. Bye -bye.